Hello guys, welcome to another episode of Mental Health Podcast with myself, Matthew Riggs, Ed Archer, and today we're joined by none other than Stephen Lewis Barrett, content creator. How are you doing, bud? How are we doing? Right, you, doing? you good? I'm good. You well? Very well. Good, good. Good, good. Okay, welcome to our podcast. Um, so let's get into it. Um, basically, you just want to find out a little bit about yourself, maybe a bit of a background, sort of, you know, where, mental, it, all yeah, where it all started and obviously how mental health affected you and that sort of stuff. Oh, well, I'm 50, so uh, we've got to go back a bit. We've yeah. got time, don't worry. <laughs> part two, part three. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, mental health's taken a big roller coaster of a ride, um, starting really for when I come out as being gay, my sexuality. Um, was with girls right up until I was about 22, 23. Um, suffered really badly. I was running two different lives, hiding it from my mum, um, hiding it from a lot of my family, and didn't really know how to cope with it. We didn't have the internet then. There was no one really to reach out to. There was like, my first ever person with a gay person was like putting a newspaper article in the paper. So it was going that far back. Mm -hmm put my little name in there, little article, used to go down to the phone box and listen to all these people on there, just talk to them. And they'd send a little message and I thought, I just want to meet someone. Mm. But I just didn't have, I don't know, I just didn't have the balls to do anything like that. I didn't, mm. didn't want to step forward into it. And I was running a completely different life with my, you know, I was a, a builder at the time then and I was keeping that quiet from everyone up there. My mental health was just going so up and down. I had a girlfriend and it was, um, I went abroad with my dad um, and it was, I think we were there for about two weeks. <clears throat> and, uh, so I got a bit of a drive for that last night. Um, yeah, we was out there for about two weeks and I, I, my dad was getting on a little bit. We was out there for a family thing. My girlfriend was flying out and um, something happened. It was my first ever time. I tried it with a guy, tried something. <clears throat> never done anything like this but had these thoughts and always thought well I should do so I try something it was on this night I tried it with this guy and um, my dad was taken ill that it was, it was taken ill a couple of nights before went into hospital I was out tried it with this guy the following day we got called rushed into hospital my dad had died um, Yeah. And um, I blamed myself for a good year. Couldn't deal with what I'd done. It was like, my dad was homophobic, my dad was racist. He was just, he was a lovely family man, but he was one of the stereotypical West Ham supporters would be football on a Sunday. Old school. Yeah. Not educated in that, that regard. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't educated in that regard. I used to go to gay clubs with my girlfriend and I keep you back to the wall, that sort of thing. Um, and I just blamed myself. My girlfriend was flying out there, all my family were flying out, and my dad had died, and I just literally crumbled. <clears throat> Couldn't deal with it. Went back with my girlfriend. I thought I was being punished. It was like, what I did was so wrong, and I went in on myself. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I was really heavily into doing drugs at the time then, because I was into like the rave scene and stuff, and... Um, I couldn't cope with that either. I was trying to get off of the drugs. Said to myself, um, I'm not going to do these drugs anymore because it was affecting my mental health. Mm. I've got to deal with the sexuality thing I'll do with this. Went back with my girlfriend and I was trying to deal with my, my dad's death and reason with what, what happened, what I'd done. But I sort of I put a, a stop to it. I thought, I'm not going to do any of this. Not, I'm not going to feel like this. But it kept coming back to me. Every now and then I'd have these feelings and thoughts about it. Like flashbacks. Yeah. Like, yeah, and but because of what happened with my dad, I literally just pushed it away for so long. Um, then me and my girlfriend were arguing. You know, it just wasn't going right. There were so many things. So I split up with her, and that's when I put this article in the newspaper just to meet someone. I just wanted to meet another gay person. It was like when we was younger, we used to. I mean, you say that about gay people. I used to spit at this guy in the in the street. We used to call him Kevin the Queer. And it was like how you was educated. It was. We used to speak to this guy and we used to like, we, it was a glucinifier. It was like some, it was some random person in the park. And we'd look at him and think, oh, you dirty queer. Because we'd been taught that it was wrong. Whatever he was doing, we thought he was queer. We mm. didn't really know what we were saying. But it's it probably was, what yeah. you've heard from yeah. other people. It's just what, yeah, no, it's like, I'm educated. Um, 
and then I look back on some of the things that I did and I was like, oh God, I was horrible to this person. We didn't even know what his sexuality was. Mm. Um, and yeah, I just, I literally was crumbling in every direction, wanting to speak to a gay person. I put this advert in the paper, got all these messages and I started to become excited about a possible different life. We didn't have the internet there, so I couldn't easily contact people. And it was just that first contact. And I met this guy called Rob. And it was like... <laughs> It was so embarrassing. I met him to do some sort of sexual stuff. We both had no idea. We both wore condoms. We both do, like, we didn't have any mm. full sex or anything, but it was literally just touching each other with mm. a condom on. We were so <laughs> frightened by it. it was like, so I look at it now, I think, you fucking idiots. Um, met him, and he actually become one of my best friends for about two years. And I kept that secret. I had two. I had a different name. I was called... Um, what's I called? I, I was a different age. I had a different name. So if any of my straight mates see me out and I was with, like, if any of my gay mates were in Lakeside or something... Oh, and they saw it happened, you. It happened. I, um, I was called Brad. Hmm. And they shouted out, oh, hey, Brad, how you doing like that? And I was with my straight mates. And the, well, like, who the fuck is that? I went, no idea. Carry on walking. Hmm. Completely <coughs> blank. But I had a cover for it. So that was my cover yeah. for it. But I, So I was lying to my gay mates, lying to my straight mates and lying to myself. Hmm. And I crumbled on that. And in the end, I had to tell my gay mates, look, I'm not Brad. I'm Steve. They mm. carried on calling me Brad because it had been years. <laughs> it's not Dave, it's Rob. Yeah, I, I, I was about six years older as well. Um, but all this double life thing, it was just, it, I couldn't stand the lying. And I end up, my brother's um, wife at the time now, her sister was a lesbian. And when I suddenly see there was a connection, I was going to tell her. I needed to tell somebody that could then possibly help me tell my mum. <clears throat> But I didn't want to tell my mum because she'd already lost my dad and it had been such a heartbreak there, I didn't want to break her heart again. Mm. Didn't want to let her down in any regard, but it was eating away at me. Every every day I was like, I was so stressed. I'd quit being, I, was, I worked in a bank then, I'd become a builder. The drugs and everything took hell to me and I was literally just wanted a job that I could bang nails in, do nothing, sit on the floor and not think. Mm. And it was that's what I ended up doing. I ended up working for someone, come out of the job that I was in, um, to try and settle my mind that I could think and not physically do anything with, uh, with regard to work. And uh, I wrote mom, I wrote my mum a letter, sat down, wrote her everything in it, <clears throat> told my sister-in-law, she was fine with it. My brother cried for two days. He was very, very upset. He obviously instantly thought of HIV, instantly thought of all these bad things, never thought of anything good, thought my life was going to be ending. I wasn't going to have the kids, I wasn't going to have all these different things. So I was in a relationship that she had two kids. I brought kids up. Um, so I'd experienced all of that, but I was this whole new exciting life that I kept looking forward to. Mm. I could just be whoever I wanted to be. Um, but I needed to tell my mum, and my mum was the one important person, mm. but I was dreading it so much. Wrote this letter out, and I've, I've still got the letter now, and I've put it online, and it's helped so many people. Mm. But it was literally word for word. How long did it take <laughs> you to write that letter? I don't even know. Did yeah. you just like doing <clears throat> I wrote it? I wrote it straight off. Yeah. And there's spelling mistakes, there's different things in it, and there's a little bit of waffle, but <coughs> the emotion is so raw because. You haven't had to really think about what you're putting in, you're no, just. It's just exactly. It's an outpouring, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But I wanted my mum to feel exactly what I was feeling <coughs> without, because I'm the sort of person I cry and I get all my emotion just comes out. And I wanted to tell her, I'm person. But I couldn't because I wouldn't get the words out to her. Yeah. So I wrote her this letter, asked my sister-in-law to come round to the house, and she sat with my mum and my brother went round there and they opened the letter together. And I, I went out the door. I didn't come back for a good two hours or more. I just don't know what I was doing. I can't even remember. And um, it just had word for word, you know, it was just, I felt like I had a disease. I said to my mum, I had this thing in me I didn't want. I didn't want to be gay. I didn't want to be interested in that. I wanted the life that everyone else had. I wanted to be normal. What you thought was a normal... Yeah, yeah. what I've been born with. Married, yeah, kids, that's house, how I yeah. felt like if I'm having something else, I'm disappointing everyone else. And especially with my mum, especially mm. that. And I just didn't know how to you know, how to express myself at all. Um, so I wrote it down. I said to mum, I said, how I felt when dad died, I explained it word for word. I said that I'd actually tried something the eve before dad died. And I woke, woke up the next day and I blamed myself. Because I hear, I hear when we went in the hospital and said he passed. And I literally thought, that's my fault. Mm. And I blame. I know it sounds stupid, but I 
it was like punishment for doing something that he would have hated, my family would have hated and thought it was disgusting. I actually felt sick in my stomach the first time I ever did something with a guy. I actually threw up because I physically had been taught that it was wrong. Mm. So it's like something you know that's wrong, but it kept wanting, you kept wanting to do it. But when you did it, you felt sick mm. because it's, it was something that hadn't been accepted. Mm. No, I didn't know no gay people or anything. Mm. Um, and I'd held that for so long and blamed myself for so long that it was just eating away at me. And my mum read it. She, she had to read it quite a few times, but she didn't really react the way I wanted her to. I just wanted her to cuddle me to this. Mm. But she was quite stern. She, she was hurt the fact that I blamed myself but she felt she was old school as well. She didn't know no gay people. She didn't know anything like that. She was disappointed I was not going to have the lifestyle that she wanted me to have. Mm. Um, because back then, I mean... I think that generation as well, like, they were brought up in a society where it was illegal. Yeah. yeah. Like, if you were found to be gay, you were chemically castrated. Yeah. And that, and we know now, that's, it's at the end of the day, like, I'm like one of those people, love's love. It doesn't yeah. matter what, yeah, who yeah, you yeah. love, yeah. as long as you're happy. And yeah. I think... Mean, yeah, when unfortunately it's that kind of it's that you, if you've been brought up thinking a certain thing, yeah, you're always gonna it's, think it's it. you're fighting, <laughs> you're fighting. It wasn't the fact that I might have been hiding when I was younger with me. There wasn't even a, a bisexual choice then, it was literally if you have thoughts one or the guy, other, you're this. So I sort of got pushed into it in a way that it was like, what well, do you get turned on by guys more or girls more? You've got to make a choice, and I feel. If people just didn't label things and didn't go, right, you, you're this and you're that, we'd all live so much better because I do think it's... There's, I've, I've experienced it from every aspect. There's women that have, you know, tendencies to go and have a lesbian affair when they hit 30. They weren't born a lesbian. You know, there's guys that do that throughout their life. They might have a little gay experience or something. They weren't born gay. Some people think that they're born gay. Some people think that, well, I don't think I was. I don't know if some people want to say that I was suppressing it. But everyone has an opinion, and mm. it's very horrible to be. You, I always think you can be, you can have an opinion, but unless you've walked the actual person's shoes, you can't judge it whether it's right or wrong. Yeah, you can't say it's one hundred percent fact yeah. that this is how you felt. But everyone wants to. They want you to fit. They want you to fit into a certain category. Yeah. I mean, gay people do enough of that. They all want to say we're this, we're this, we're this, mm. and then it feels okay. Yeah. But there's so I, many variants. I mean, they, gay people hate bisexual people, mm. you know, because they don't want the challenge of a girl. You know, you know, and you know, it's it's a battle to fit into a certain place. But that's the thing, like, where does then that line cross? Like, if you just sit there, like, as a, I don't know, I'm a married man sat on the sofa with my wife, going, I wonder what it would be like with a guy. Is that then? Am I am I then gay because yeah. I'm thought about what it might be like? Like, yeah. and that's the thing. Then where's where's that line? And I guess, yeah, then that that's. For, for someone like yourself, that's got to be some mental torture. To it think. was. It was <coughs> torturous for so long. because I think it's... I mean, it's... It's not... Saying it's not easier now. It's more accepted. And there's the internet and there's the help and stuff. I didn't have no help. I literally just wanted to meet a gay person and go, Hi. What, what is it what like? Is it like? Yeah. Or, or just talk to someone and go, You're right. There is I'll other find people. Find some common yeah. ground. But I was hiding two lives. I had to, you know, to have two different names, two different everything. <laughs> I didn't yes. even know who I was. And I, I, I did actually go off to Australia. I went off to Australia for like three months. And it was the most liberating experience of my life. My friends out there all went off. I was left in this place, the other side of the world from everyone else. They went off to work and I looked at it and I just suddenly felt this complete drop off me that I felt relief. I was no more Brad. I wasn't, I could be Steve. I could be anyone I wanted. I could, be, I could say you. to someone, I'm gay. I'm this age, and they go, oh, okay. So it was like one of them things, I could be whoever I wanted so to be. So starting a new life, yeah. isn't it? And I just felt liberated that I was, I was on my own. I mean, I slipped back into, I was Steve, I was this age when I got back home, hmm. but I was in a completely different country and no one knew me. Um, so I knew that it was exciting and I wanted to explore this whole new world and I actually dumped and cut off all of my straight friends. Uh, my girlfriend, I literally just disappeared. Hmm. It was only until Facebook came out people started to find me again. Mm. And they're like, oh, where have you been with like, And it's one of my best friends. We used to go to, I explained to him when Facebook came out and it was quite funny. Um, it was about five years after I'd actually come out to some of my friends and family. And he said to me, um, well, I explained to him, I said, do you remember when we used to go on those guy holidays away? 
and I used to sneak off. We'd pull a bird, we'd both pull two birds, he'd go back with one, and I'd end up dumping my one, and she'd go back to her, her mate and say, oh, he's, he's left me on my own. And my mate would get really pissed off. Mm. He'd say, oh, just about to do the deed and couldn't follow through because you've dumped me off one. Yeah. We did it every night. And he said, Steve, why can't you just pull one of these girls? Oh, I found the gay area. I was going off, dumping the girl and finding the gay area and going off with guys. Yeah. So I was like all comfortable with that, but my mate never knew. Mm. He thought I was still with girls. You were just being an arsehole. I went until five, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't wee manning You were messing well. his chances yeah. up. So five years later, I connected with him on Facebook and said, do you remember that night there? I found the gay scene. He's like, no, why didn't you tell me about it? I went, we weren't accepted. No one would have accepted mm. me being gay then. So what no. about, um, obviously, you obviously went into like carpentry, builder and all that sort of stuff about going on sites and stuff. And like, uh, you've got like guys, you know, the still typical builders, like a bit landy men. That's, that's, yeah, that that, like, that you was know. probably one of the... So how did you deal with that situation? <clears throat> one of the hardest things was literally, all right, you get quite camp people or... <clears throat> You see someone, you think, yeah, they're gay. They come out once. I come out every single time I meet someone because I don't come off cross as what the stereotypical gay person is. On this building site, how it worked about was um, I had this double life. There was this gay guy that worked in a bar and he knew me. It was like I was a gay builder, but I kept it under the radar for so long. And all my mates used to go in there on a Friday and get their checks paid to each other. Mm. And this gay guy worked behind the bar. And I was like, I knew, I thought I knew he was in there. Anyway, he started speaking to my workmates and said, oh, well, I know Steve, yeah, he's gay. Coming on a Monday Cheers, morning. Mate. Yeah, no, <laughs> well, I didn't know then until Monday morning, there was this young scaffolder working for me. He was actually working for me. He'd been working for me for like three, four weeks. Top of the scaffold, early morning, wasn't really thinking this was right. And he turned around and he said, oh, I heard you a bit of a batty boy. You like it up your ass." And I just looked and I was like, wow. <laughs> yeah, you've got a fucking problem with it, yeah. what? And I just, I literally, as if I'd had a pause moment, I was like, oh my God, I've said yes. I've said yes to somebody that I'm gay. And he, the, the, his reaction was, I mean, he just literally shut the conversation down, didn't know how to talk to me. And he went, so what do you think of that song, Going to a Gay Bar? I was like, <laughs> what the fuck has that got to do with me? And he didn't know how to talk to me. I Did said, you? we've been working for three weeks together yeah. and we chat and we talk. Now, because I've said I'm into guys, you can't talk to me. Mm. And I, it literally, from then onwards, <laughs> building sites. I like. I was with someone for about seven years in a relationship, so I was quite cool with my um, sexuality then. And but I like the shock value, so I got a new building site, and we'd be sitting there with some Polish guys, some all different foreigners, and there's a lot of like homophobia in different countries. So I mm. knew when to say something or when not to say something, but. We'd be sitting there at lunch and there'd be like 30 odd builders in the room and they're going, oh, like, what's your wife's name? Are you, are you single? Like, Dave. Like, oh, no. And his <laughs> name was Kenny. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, his name's Kenny. <laughs> and I'd sort of laugh like that. And they went, well, you're gay. And I went, yeah. Like, listen. <laughs> no, my wife's no, just got a no, really no, weird then, name. Then, 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 the, then the conversations that you knew the people that would get up and either leave, because there was some that would leave or not even approach me or talk to me yeah. ever again. But there was then other ones, usually the younger ones that were like a bit of banter and stuff. Yeah. They would talk about, oh, so what's it like to have it up your ass and what's it like? <laughs> and they would talk about it. But every conversation ended up about that on site, mm. which I didn't mind. It was really cool. But it was like some of them, you could tell, they were like, oh, let's just not talk about it. Like, I don't want to talk about anal. I don't want to talk about <laughs> what's this. Here. But yeah. I quite like educating them because the one thing that they didn't realise, and this was quite touching, there's this one guy in there. And I said to him, I said, him saying, why do we have gay pride? Why, why is it? I said, well, I'll give you an example. I said, I'll walk down the high street with my boyfriend as a gay person. I want to touch his hand every now and then. I want to do something. Show of affection. Without, yeah, but I want to do it not in a public show of, just, um, of affection, but just go, oh, look over there. But as like, a gay person, mm. we second guess our every move. So I'll go, oh, I can't do that because some, there's a load of lads over there. So we don't feel normal in our everyday action. We just suddenly look and think, I can't do that, and you avoid it. So you become inertly sort of like awkward sometimes. Mm. And I might want to hold his hand for a joke or something like that, or just do it. And you have to change everything you do. And I said, yeah. it's those little simple things that straight people take for granted. All those tactile things that you don't realise. That's why gay people do it sometimes to piss you off. They put it in front of you. Because they've had to suppress it for so long. Yeah. yeah. And there is people out there, I get it, that overly do it. But it's because they're not safe in the places they want to be safe to do that type of thing. Yeah. And that, I said, you've got to get that into your head that that's why 
sometimes we do it to piss you off because they just it's like you can't do that you can't do that went, of course we can we're in love for the, then that's the thing it goes back to that whole like for a long time it was seen as dirty it was yeah. illegal well everyone <coughs> thought gay people were paedophiles for a good 50 years we've been fighting that to say you can leave us with our kids and there's more straight people out there that are, you know it's not about your sexuality or your gender or anything like that that's a completely different thing. But they took, you know, that I had someone last night when I was out last night trying to debate with me and he was comparing us to murderers and paedophiles. And I'm like, are you actually that far back that you're not educated enough to realise what you're saying? Yeah. And it was just, I thought, oh, we just got over this. It's taken us 50 years to really try and push mm. that it's not about that. Um, and that, and that's the thing. that And obviously, I, I, I don't know because... I'm in a heterosexual relationship, I'm married and I've got kids and all that sort of stuff. So, like you say, I can't make past comment on something that I haven't lived, but surely that's got to take an awful like toll on your it, mental uh, health. Is, having, is, just having to think about certain well, it, little I, things like holding someone's hand. That it was horrible, <laughs> the fact that you couldn't do those things. Just, I think it built up. You didn't realise it built up inside you. You're like, I can't do that, I can't do that. And that's why the safe places, that's why you have like Soho. Because I went on a date years back and this guy held my hand and I was like, oh my God, this feels so weird. But it feels good. Mm. And I walked through part of London, but as soon as we got to where Leicester Square was, I took my hand yeah. away because of that fear. Mm. But it's like, it was exciting. And you think it's the most simplest little things like that that people don't realise that's what we just want to do without the, you know, you might see two pretty stunning lesbians and you'll go, oh my God. But you see two guys in there, you take the piss out of them. That's, like, oh. and, and that's, yeah. a, that's also... It's a masculine... Like, you know, we, we've, got, we've got a society where, I don't know, like there's this mate, a lot of men that have this fantasy of two drop-dead yes, gorgeous, blonde, <laughs> leggy blonde <laughs> lesbians and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> and that's okay. Being gay, yeah. if you're absolutely stunning women, that's cool. Yeah. But two guys that love each other, want to be yeah. together, that's disgusting. Well, right? that's the same as when, <coughs> you know, you get two lesbians on there, so they, they think about what, you know, they think they're in with a chance with it, but they don't want to think about what, you know, guys or anything. Oh no, I know it's there, but don't talk about it like this. And I went, well, why can you talk about one with not, you know, mm. the other? It's the same. Yeah. It's just a different gender. And it, and it, it's crazy to me, like how, if, like I've heard, I've heard conversations where someone goes, yeah, I'm gay. And they go, well, like, like you said, like, what's it like yeah. doing this? What's it like doing that? You never have that. I've never sit there and go, oh, I'm married. Yeah, What's well, it like having sex with your wife? Can you, can, you, can you imagine every time you meet someone, you either get referred to as gay Steve, hmm. or so your gen, your sexuality is put first, hmm. or you have to tell them your whole coming out story. <laughs> so every time you meet someone, you go, right, I did this, da 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 Right, next person. Oh, I did it too. When you need to you straight? Re- what you need to when, do is record it and just go, yeah. there you go, I'll send, you know it, to, I'll send it to I'll you. I'll tell you what though, that's just like when I was, like, I used to be in most people's phones, Fat Matt. Yeah. I used to hate I'm it. in my brother's phone. I'm gay I said to, I mean, gay no, I'm in Batty Boy. <laughs> my brother has got Batty Boy there. I said to him, Craig, I've got you down as Craig Brother. He went, I can put you down as Batty Boy Steve. <laughs> I was like, I can add his name. <laughs> so, I like the humour. It's, yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah, but it's yeah. in the connotation. But yeah, right. I know what you mean. It's not nice. But yeah. just, another, just another question for you. Where would you say would be your breaking point? What was your lowest point mentally? Is, I mean, I think it's going to be most probably your shingles type thing. That's yeah, really bad, right? Yeah. I'll, where, I'll, but where would you, would you, you can you can choose what was your worst? Um, so. I've had so many. Uh, shingles was probably one of the hardest things I've ever dealt with in my life, even coming out and stuff, because I woke up one morning with this, you know, it was like a spot across my face. I was going through a very, very stressful time. I didn't know what shingles was. didn't hardly know what it was at all until I educated myself a bit. But I got this spot on my nose, suddenly woke up in the morning and thought, what the fuck is this? And it, it spread. Within hours, it was getting bigger. It was like a red patch across my face. Getting really stressed over it. And then day two went past and it was going all over. So I called the doctor. So your eyes as well, weren't it? It went, it went all over this one side of my face. But within, I went to a disfigurement clinic three hospitals, within a week, I was going blind in one eye. I had all of this breakout over my face. They didn't actually recognise what it was till it was too late. You're meant to get the tablets in you before with three days, and then you can get rid of it. And it took three months for me to it fully come out. I hid myself in my house for 
at least a month. I I was it was I had a housemate there and I was telling him, please don't bring no one around, please. And I was hiding, I was renting my spare room out and he had the whole house and still brought people around. And I, it was a lot of that that led on to the stress. I didn't realise how bad it was, mm. it was stress related. But I was losing my eyesight. I literally, I wrapped these bandages around myself. I was waking up every morning looking how bad it was. The spots just took over my face. It was like creepy crawlies all in your skin, in my beard. Um, all I was left with was Google. So I'm looking on there and the doctors got the tablets for me, but they didn't give me the strongest ones. And I went back again. But they, every time I went out, I'd wrap these bandages around my head. I look like the invisible man. I can laugh at it now. <laughs> yeah. But it was all over one side and then I had glasses on it. It was in the summer. And I drove my van to the hospital and this was a this was a breaking point. I got to the hospital, it was at South End. So from Basildon to South End, 20 minutes. I got there. I had all these bandages around me and I sat in there. You know the big letters they do in the optician thing? Mm. I was in this doctor's and he said, can you move the bandages? And I, I, every time I sat in a hospital, I made sure that I sat somewhere or I passed someone so they didn't pass this side. So they walked past mm. that side. So I was always leaning this way. And I see people in this disfigurement clinic. I, I had so much respect for them because I knew what they were going mm. through. I sat in there. And I could see a big giant mirror in front of me, the letters behind me. And I wrapped these, took these bandages off like that and I just broke. Because um, I see how bad, I looked like the elephant man, it was horrendous, absolutely horrendous. And I was trying to cover it up and um, I knew I was losing my eyesight because it was, the pressure was going at the back of my eye. And he said, so I've got to come down here. And he said, who are you with? Because I broke, I literally broke down. I hadn't cried to anyone, I'd hidden it from everyone else gone completely off of social media um, and I said I'm with my friend it's fine he said we've got to put these drops in your eyes he said it, you're, you're going to dilate and you're not going to see properly out of your good eye well I couldn't see anyway I couldn't see none of the letters and I drove from there back home blind I literally could see about four feet in front of me but it's very blur I got in my van because I didn't want to ask for help I, I, my mum didn't know I didn't tell no one about it. I kept completely quiet about it. And I went home and just cried. Um, and it, I, I slowly got rid of it. It took about a year to get rid of all the scarring. Yeah. And I dealt with it and got over it. But I went back to work on a building site. And I actually lost my job. Because all I wanted was just to meet people and see people. I'd been hidden away. I'd lost all my, all my confidence, my yeah. body, everything else. But I had this really bad scarring across my face yeah. and it was just all pitted where all the scars were. I lost, I mean, I've got no feeling in my face now. I can't feel across there. Mm. I can't feel up here. Um, but it didn't really matter. I just wanted to get back out into the into the world again. Went on site, as the builders usually do. They called me a leper. They thought they was going to catch it. Same as the gay thing. It, it was a bit of banter. And I, I took it. I taken mm. everything yeah. else. <laughs> They were they put me on a separate area. I said, look, Steve, we don't want anyone catching it like this. I said, you can't catch it. I said, please, just look at it. I said, it can't. And it was just, I said, I just wanted to be around people that, you know, I've been locked away in my house for months. Hmm. And he, the guy caught me on my phone a few times because I, I was on working on my own because they didn't want to work with me. So I'm working on the other side of the building site. And I said, I went on my phone a little bit just to see a bit of something. And... Uh, the next day he said Steve you've been on your phone too much he said I don't want you in no more he said you're sacked hmm. and I was like are you joking me I've worked for you for two years and you have treated me like that and I was just absolutely mortified but it was one of those things at the time I was doing the adult stuff that I was doing I was doing it's like called only fans <laughs> um, no what is that <laughs> I was doing that as a sideline and I just thought you know what fuck you lot I don't need mate. the building sites no more. I don't need this shit that people can take away from me. Hmm. Um, and I started doing that full on, started going from there. It led from one thing to another. I went back to the building site, got some other work with someone else. And long story short, I then become a full on content creator. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I've not been back to the building site since. But yeah, my life's sort of taken very much of a roller coaster, mental health wise. Even with the porn industry, you know, there's there's a lot of things that hit you out there. Do you see it as liberating though? Do you it, see have is it taught you to embrace your sexuality, or is it done the opposite? Um, or a bit both. 
I don't know. The, the sexuality, I mean, I'm coping. I mean, I still find it awkward thinking if I get married to a guy, that will be two guys in a suit, you know. My ex now. Depends what you're into, to be yeah, fair. It's just, it's I reckon just, you'd look good in white, yeah. I'm not going to lie. Well, no, I did wear a pink. I remember going with my boyfriend to a, a wedding. He wore pink and I wore blue. And I was like, oh, how stereotypical is that? <laughs> but I look back at the photos and I thought, why did we do that? <laughs> Why'd we wear yellow or something? It was just like, you know, colour mm. really. But I don't know. I still, I still find it hard with the whole sexuality. It's just, I, I, like, I like the shock value and I like that sort of thing, but... I don't know. Sometimes I think, oh, should I just go back to a woman? It would be easier. Like, I, I look at it. Do you think it'll always, for you, be a, str- be not, like a struggle? Like, just to be able yeah, to just I do, fully like, accept it? I, I've accepted it myself, sexually, with the industry oh. I'm in and, and that. But marriage and all that, I wanted that. I wanted, like, I brought kids up when I was younger. Mm. I brought two, you know, two, a boy and a girl up and went through nappies and a toddler. So I'm great. I've experienced all that. But I don't know. I think back then, I... I was fast tracked, and I didn't really decide. You know, I know people go, "Oh, you either born this way or not." I wasn't. It was just different. So I never really. I look at the options I've got now for straight acting guys, or you know what I've looked at. Then I don't know why women say the best looking guys are gay. They're not. Um, <laughs> well, not that I've been through them all, but I just, <laughs> I've been through them all swiping. And yeah. Swiping. I'm swiping constantly, and I look at it and I think. Oh, you know, just have like a, a normal basis of a, a woman relationship but I look at it sometimes thinking oh, some relationships like, they don't have sex and stuff maybe I should go back to a woman relationship <laughs> I can have a cup of dinner and do anything and then just like but it's not I just think I just don't <laughs> want to be yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, just, I just don't <laughs> want to be cook with dinner don't you from your bath yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I don't know um I, I, maybe I know when I was younger I used to like I hang on to my my, my mates as in like a bromanship mm. so I know it's like the lads all the time I never really got girls girls are like you know blokes we, and Neanderthal no one gets girls we, no, 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 no one gets women we, we guys, guys are black and white we say yes we say no we mean that we don't mean the colour in the, in the middle you, say, you know like, girls well, complicate they go I'm fine <laughs> you're not fine yeah do you love me <laughs> yeah. oh and I was told you I love you. Oh, well, you haven't shown me. So it's like, blokes are very Neanderthal. You can, that's the only good thing about, or one of the best things about a gay relationship, you can both have sex, both come, both face the other way. And go to sleep. And go to sleep. <laughs> you know you're happy. You haven't got to go, oh, did you come? Are you happy? Are you like, was it good for you? Do you need a cuddle now? Yeah, do you want to go for another few more hours? And you think, oh, I just want to go to bed. Yeah. So you can do that in a gay relationship and you feel fine. And yeah. you've got no guilt. You're probably laying there the other way going, she happy I'm not. Right. Was twenty five seconds enough? <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's more than enough. Okay. <laughs> so she's telling you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like I think, from what from what I've seen of you, like you're you you you're an inspiration to people. Look, you've come out quite late in your life, like, and I think that's potentially why you're probably still adjusting to it because you, like you said you were fast tracked to it it's kind, yeah. it wasn't kind of oh I'm 12, 13 I yeah. like that boy and you graduate into it it's like shit I'm gay now yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I think yeah for, to, see, to see you and talk about what you do I, I love it and I love the fact that you're kind of so open about it now I yeah. have to be I mean I mean paper news all the time I told <laughs> you know, it's just all the different things I'm very much open about it I think it's because I hid so much when I was younger I want people to know everything. I mean, I'll probably say too much and tell them everything, but I don't, I hate lying. I just hate, I, but it, you, it's eaten away at me for so long about lying. I'll lay everything on the plate. And if you don't like me, that's yeah, your problem. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. there is, I get hate all the time. I don't, I, and I don't understand why. And I'm like, I'm actually a genuinely nice guy. And you get hate on it. I'm like, oh God. Like, I mean, obviously you remember you said, telling me that you obviously you, with your mum, it took you a while to tell your mum. Uh, about, the industry yeah, though, yeah. I mean, yeah. she thought you still thought you was a builder she still thought I had a van with tools in and I swapped them tools for <laughs> <laughs> they are they are tools <laughs> yeah, yeah just slightly different yeah. Um, yeah. Is she, what is she she's like a, now she's 83 um, she didn't there was a need to know basis in that regard I mean it's only been about a month since I told her um, she's actually had a photo in the newspaper which is quite funny <laughs> um, but I wanted I wanted to tell her because I went and did I went out to America did a bit of networking out there. Did uh, the porn industry out there is just immense. Is you and I think I went there with all this intention of networking and getting out there and trying to earn more money and stay in this industry and think yeah I'll make the most of it. And I was overwhelmed by it. It's, it was like oh god I'm just Steve Barrett from Basildon and suddenly these people want to work with me that are in America and they've heard from me from the other side of the world. 
And I just suddenly got catapulted into this massive industry. We went to Las Vegas, New York and LA uh, in the course of three weeks and it was like a whirlwind. I come back and crashed and my mum was like, you've just had a jolly up in America, you know, why are you so miserable? Yeah. Why you? And I, she didn't realise, I went, mum, you don't need ins and outs of what's going on. Mm. And I'd lied to her again about what I do for work. And that started to eat away at me. And it's, I realised I can't, I have to be open with everyone. Mm. My brother knew about it, my family knew about it. Um, you know, everyone else knew except my mum. Um, but I didn't want to tell her, it's one of those things, I didn't want to upset her and disappoint her. But the best thing in this industry it's given me a lifestyle that I could go and see her every single day, which I have done since lockdown. I've seen her every single day. I've called her every day and I can go around there in seconds because this lifestyle has given me the freedom of that. I might have to go back to being a builder if it, you know, don't know, daddy Paul. Or, you know, I'm 50 now, so I don't know how long you can do this for. Um, it's how, how long you can perform, yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is AI coming out soon? Uh, and so I, went and I, I broke. I literally, I had an argument with her and it was about something about being on holiday and coming back and being miserable. And I went, Mum, you just don't know what's going on in my life. I said, like, I, I got to a point, I come back, and I don't know why, was, I had a lot of health, I had some health issues, I had some things with my dog, I had some, the tax man coming at me. I had so many things coming down on me at once and the over, you know, overwhelmed by America. And I sort of crumbled and I just suddenly... I, I, was it your mic drop moment? Yeah, it was a, it was a <laughs> no, it was a, it was a, it was a moment that I just suddenly thought, what am I doing with my life? I've, no, everyone knows what I'm doing. It wasn't so much that my mum didn't know. I just suddenly thought, do I want to do this? Mm. Am I, am I good enough for this? Should I? Uh, no, does anyone want me because I do this? I have been single for ten years, and I just suddenly got really, really down and depressed, and just didn't know where I was going with it, and. I crumbled and you knew full well what happened. Um, I think it was just too many things all at once. It's hard to keep up, isn't it? And I had a little, uh, about a week, uh, feeling like I didn't want to be here anymore. And it just, I had two friends um, commit suicide. <clears throat> about uh, a month before. And they're, they've been in the porn industry for a long time and done things and you get people in this industry that push themselves and push themselves to things they might not want to do but everyone judges them no matter what you're doing if you're in this industry people are judging you left right and centre and it's not in a nice way they can talk about it and go oh yeah that's, that's good but really behind the scenes you feel that pressure mm. and you know it could be a fruitful industry but it's really tough on your mental health and two of my friends committed suicide and I know a lot of people that have taking their own lives because of it. You know, drugs, the, the, the all, you know, I've, I stopped doing drugs when my dad died 26 years ago and never vowed, I vowed on his deathbed to never take them again. I didn't want any more added things to take my mental health down. And um, that took its toll on me that they took their own lives. And the pressure of trying to earn money, the pressure of social media, driving you down and everyone else driving you down and you want to succeed and you're in that game and I'm in that game and I want to, do the best that I can, but I don't want people to go, oh, you know, you look at it badly, but it's still a job. Yeah, it might be a different type of job, but I've never regretted it because it's given me time with my mum because she's 83 and I don't want that time taken away. So even if it was like something, you know, I've got that time with her and I can't take that back. Um, so I need you to tell her and I crumbled and... It was about 11 o'clock at night. He was in a bad way. Yeah. Because I remember, I remember like, he was in a bad way. All right? I mean, I was worried about you, to be honest, and I kept coming around from the way in from work just to make sure you were still around and ringing you in the day and just I mean, trying to keep you... I had had stupid thoughts in my head thinking it'd be easier if I weren't here. I just, just didn't want to deal with it because I had so many things going on in my head at once. Um, but I've had my sister... I had my sister-in-law... Um, she committed suicide. My nephew, um, a year after his mum died, uh, he jumped in front of a lorry and he took his own life. And I know, I know what it does to the families around you when you take life away and you don't give the other people an opportunity to help you. And I don't want to do that. 
Plus, I don't think I was brave enough. You know, it takes a lot to take your own life. Um, even looked at my dogs and I thought, I can't do it to them. I think it was just like a bad time. Yeah, he was going for a bad mm. time, definitely. Um, but I had to tell my mum, <coughs> I woke her up at 11 o'clock at night. She's 83, she's like a bag of bones. And I held her and I went, Mum, I've got to tell something to you. She's like, just woke up. And I said, Mum, I, I do adult work. Um, I just want you to tell me that you're proud of me. Hold me. Say that I'm okay and I'm going to be all right. That's all I wanted. Because this industry, even social media, everyone wants part of you. They just want you for something. They use you. And I didn't want to be used anymore. I wanted my family just to go, Steve, I can deal with this industry. If I've got my family going, you're all right. Deal with it. You're okay. Mm. Um and she said all the right things. I went, Mum, you don't need to know the ins and outs of it. But I have not regretted any of it because I can see you every single day and I get time with you. Mm. And I never got the time with my dad. And that is what I wanted. And yeah. I can't regret anything now because I can see her every day. Um, but but that's that's the thing. And it's and it's amazing. And, and it's, brill- it's, it's brilliant that you talk about it and how you're like really really open about it and I think sometimes like no ha- no matter how big we are how grown up we are we still want our mum and I think that takes I think for you I think it's your mum that you have to your validation is your mum and I think to be able to tell her that is a big thing and you should be proud of yourself to be that open and honest and, You've done and, a good, I, and, and I, it's good to talk especially when you're that low and you you want you're having those kind of thoughts. It is good, and you've done you've done really well to be able to talk to someone. I just wanted. I just I hate lying. I hate hiding stuff. And you know, the more open you are, the more someone might notice mm. that because that is that's the thing. Like I was crumbling, and the weirdest thing out there, and I hear it with other people. You, the people that are closest to you, you want them to notice, and they don't some random person that's never met you from the other side of the world says, are you okay? And I'm like, how has my friend not noticed me? As I said, like to be open and honest. To your mum, yeah. With your mum, I think. Or with anyone. I think when you're feeling that low, to seek help. Especially, I think with your experiences of other people, family taking their own lives, it's good to see that people, you, are, you're, you want to talk about it. I feel like we get judged no matter what we do in life these days, you can never do anything, <coughs> anything right. It's like, no matter what you do, there's always yeah. someone, someone wants to put their two pennies Yeah, everyone thing. wants to judge you, no matter whatever you do. I don't do. know why it's so easy to, people hate on you for no reasons. Or they just, it's easier to hate on someone than be proud and be say, yeah, you, you're doing well, right? Mm. I, I don't get that. I've never hated on anyone on social media. I can be, you can be envious and go, oh, I wish I could do that. But I think you get these troll accounts that literally hate on people and I'm like, Why? Why do people? The thing is, you? you can see your friend do do well at something, and you'll praise them, praise them up, and want them to do well. But other people could have friends that don't want their friends to do well. They just because they're not, of it. yeah, and they end up, you know, it's just. I, I don't, I don't see the point of it. But. I love my friends succeeding. I want. I get off on my friends doing so well at things, and it's just I don't get why people want to tear you down. Mm. Um, but th- that's the thing. Like obviously, through the campaign, I get it every day. I get hate hate messages. I get trolls. And I'm starting to learn, like, it's just a reflection on them. It's their, ins- it's those people's insecurities. And, and yeah, like, I think sometimes you just have to accept it. And it's hard. Like, I do, I do want to, like, out people. I want to, like, highlight trolls and say, like, don't be like this person. But at the same time, I'm like, it's, I feel sorry for them. Yeah. Like, it, it is a reflection on them. Like, I know I'm doing well. Like at the moment, like my daughter's getting has been bullied and stuff like that. And I just tell her, like, just remember <laughs> they're they're trying to bring you down. So which means they're lower than you. Yeah, yeah of course. You just well, go higher. Yeah. And I think if you're doing you and you're happy with what you're doing, the people that are happy for you are the ones that are worth your time. Yeah. It's hard to get that realisation though, isn't it? Because there's some people that you are closest to that aren't actually that happy. And then you suddenly think I'm in the wrong circle. The same as mine, everyone. That's when it comes with age, though, yeah. I think. I think age is a big... <laughs> I sound like my dad. And, no, but, that's when you know you get older. <laughs> yeah, but I think the, the moment you start thinking, I don't care what other people think about me, is the moment you start to flourish as a person. That was in my 30s. 
Mm. My thirties. I think everyone goes through that stage. I didn't know whether I was like meant to be getting married with kids or meant to be going this direction. And I literally, I think it was when I hit forty, I was like, you know, that's when I went on naked attraction. Mm. And I suddenly think oh, I'm gonna do something really random for me. Yeah. Um, the naked not... attraction. We've got to touch on that subject. Yeah. <laughs> twice, not just once. Twice. I'm naked attraction. Yeah. That was just my moment of thinking. Right. Let's do something completely random. Do something really. Outlandish. That's what you call opening yourself up to the world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Bit that, by bit. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Slowly but surely. I, I can. I will hear that music forever. Even on my deathbed, I'll probably hear that music. As, dun, 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 Please you know, have that at your funeral. <laughs> Please. Yeah. So, As so, the curtains. Yeah, so I'll, I'll get uh, you know, a funeral for you. That'll go up like that. It'll be in a coloured box. <laughs> You need no, to. No, no, yeah. <laughs> a tick, I've got that Naked one. Naked attraction time. star. That's, yeah. that's, uh, think, but there's more people on there that have been actually stars, or you know, and you can Google me now with that on it. And I'm like, I do like it. It is good and it's funny, and I've owned it a little bit, and I've really milked it properly to fuck. Mm. But you know, I mean, that's what I think. That's why I get a bit of hate on there as well because I've probably milked something. But if you only get one opportunity in life, it opens up loads of other doors. And I do think this is the thing with sexuality, with everything else. If you don't try, you never know. And mm. I look at a philosophy, I'd rather live with regret of doing something than not doing it. Because mm. if you go on a holiday and you go, ah, oh, there was this trip there, I really wish I'd done that. You never get that chance again. You always think back. But if you do it and didn't like it, you pass it, you let it go. Yeah. So I look at that philosophy with everything now. Yeah, you've got to take every opportunity differently. Yeah. And you never know when it's going to come around again. So if it does at all, that's it. And I think and that, that's when it comes back to, as long as you're happy... Like, and that's, it sounds very selfish. Like, you, it's not like you over everyone else and you've got to be selfish, but your happiness, like, you only get your happiness. Mm. And we know what happens when you're not happy. Like, mm. that's the thing. When you're not happy, you think some s- stupid things. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you're happy and the people around you make you happy and they've, and they've got your back, I think you're on, a, you're on at least a winning yeah. kind of run, I think. But yeah, I think for you, for yourself, like I, I just love the fact that you're so open. It's it's quite refreshing. Yeah, you don't, I'm not gonna live on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, especially for a guy as well, like us us blokes. Man. I do get a lot of you know young lads message me and you know, aspire to me. It's weird because I still don't think I'm just Steve Barrett from Basildon, uh, but I get people fitness industry, age, sexuality, all these different subjects that I've gone through in my life, and I don't realise like. I think it's being more humble. I don't want to go, oh my God, I've helped these people. Oh my God, I've helped that person. I just look at it and think, well, well you, what, you aspire to. You're trying to listen, listen to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's like, I've followed you since like you were this age or this, and I really aspire. And it's like, it wasn't until I put a, when I, you know, I had a little bit of a wobble when I put something out there and I was crying on there. I had so many people mm. reach out and I was like, I felt so alone. And I've just suddenly thought, there's a lot of people out there that actually care. Or actually notice, because social media makes you feel like they're not either. How many likes you get, how many comments you get like that, that's not important. And then suddenly you get these real people that actually are watching you. They might like, might not like your stuff or might not do anything, but they actually send a really nice message. Yeah. And you think, oh, I am being watched. I am, you know, I do. But they're, the, the they're the genuine, they're the genuine people. Oh, I get it. And there's, yeah, there yeah. are people go. I, I've seen a lot of your videos I've come up, or I had some person say I've come across your campaign literally just tonight uh, one of your videos and it just helped me get through the day and you know what if I never do anything else in my life again that I've achieved yeah. and I think sometimes it's those little things and you do like we've all got a relatively like high following now on social media and when someone goes you've really helped me today you think yeah. what me yeah, yeah. <laughs> lowly old me I've actually yeah. done something in the world and I think yeah. It is rewarding. It's that that's the rewarding bit of social media. Like yeah. you've got all yeah. those trolls and all that no. sort of stuff. There is real people out there. There is some. I mean, you do get you do get arseholes out there, but you also get the real genuine people that really you know that are, you know are nice people. I've had, had it before where I had one the other day. A lady mystery and said, "I really needed to see that today. Like my story has really helped me. Like hmm. I really needed that today. Thank you." And I was like, you know. I didn't put it up there for that reason. I just put it up there because you know, I was just sharing mm. something open. I know it's hard it to be someone. judged, but you want to do something because you suddenly realise I'm helping someone, so you want to share it that you could help another person. But then people think you're using it for clout, mm. yeah. and you're like, "Oh, come on! Like you've got me from how I am. Don't then judge me for what I'm going to use it for." Yeah, um, like I, the the perfect example of that. So I've. For a few times, I've shared a video, and there's a little girl, and she's crying for her dad, who's 
who took his own life and she's like, Daddy, Daddy, I want Daddy. And I know them. I'm Danny, Danny Bates and she is amazing. She's the biggest mental health and suicide awareness advocate. Obviously, since her husband took his own life, she's literally helped thousands of people. <laughs> and she's constantly sharing that video and has said to me, please share it and all this yeah. sort of stuff because it needs to be shown, like the effects. Yeah. And it's not some sort of emotional blackmail, like <coughs> you take your own life, this is what's going to happen to your kids. Yeah. But people also need to see the ramifications of yeah. what happens. But you get people go, why would you share that? Why don't you just give the kid a cuddle? You're doing it for clout. You're doing it to make money. It's like, no. Like, it's because you know you're, you've had that one person that you've made a difference to. Mm. So you want to make sure it helps <laughs> others. Yeah, and it's the people that judge that that aren't in that that lane or have never experienced any of that. They're just looking at it in a different light. Yeah, um, they just look at oh well, look the kid's crying. Just give it, give the kid yeah. a cuddle. Yeah, I'm sure the the mum gives like the, the uh, Danny even says like when she speaks to her kids, she doesn't make certain promises. Yeah, like you know like oh, mummy and daddy will be here forever. We'll look after you forever. Yeah. She never makes that promise anymore because her husband did that, and then. Took his own life, so he won't be around forever. She, will, but she kind of changes it, and she says stuff like, "I'll try my best to be here for as long as I can." Yeah. So she's not promising things she can't yeah. deliver, and I think showing that message, especially to young yeah. children on social media, I think is so important. But like you say, you do get people that I just think either are just there for a row, or don't understand, and I think that's where the education comes. Yeah, hundred percent. It's definitely the education on there. Yeah. Um, but I think you can preach to the high heavens about ignorance from yeah. the stuff that you've had go on in your life. And I yeah. think even to last night having a row with someone about being homophobic and all sorts <laughs> like, like we've, we're in 2024. Yeah. You know, when you look and you think you've got social media, you've got the internet, you've got everything else. How are you so not educated? Um, and I just thought my friend actually, my voice was going and I was talking to his wife and daughter got up and I was just like, all right, Let's just leave it. Let's agree to disagree. Let's just you have your opinion because I'm not gonna try. I didn't want to just try and change it. I just thought it's no point. You, you, um, you're not you. You're flogging a dead horse yeah. at that point. You yeah. know. You know they're never gonna change their opinion. So it's easier just to go whatever, mate. Just yeah. Pick your battles, isn't it? You yeah, know? and yeah. I think in in today's society, like there are a lot of things, and obviously in every kind of stratum of society, there is extremism. You'll know in in kind of the LGBTQ and the rest of the letters. Uh, rest of the letters. <laughs> yeah. the out, I, 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 I don't know which one's right yeah, at the same moment, but, but <laughs> the there's always alphabet. extremism. There's always yeah. well, this is it, and you have to do. Yeah. And that's that's what I get. Uh, where I also said about having to fit in. There's so many labels. It's all these. Like, even the LGBT, the whole community wants people to fit into a label. Because that's what fits with everyone in their head. If we just dropped... Why do we need labels? It's, it's not, just one of those things. If you stop... You know, I'm Steve. I'm not gay Steve. I'm not this. I'm just Steve. I'm Steve that just it, it wants to have a loving yeah. relationship. You're Steve. Yeah, I'm Matt. He's Ed. Yeah. How are we doing? That's yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. But, that, but that's the thing. I think even if you don't agree with stuff, I think people have just got to learn to just accept yeah. stuff. Yeah. Like, okay, you don't like that. Cool. But... What, what is you hating too, on yeah, it? Don't, don't be too opinionated that you're going to then shove your opinion onto other people to try and... It's just, you know, same as religion, same as everything else. You touch on so many subjects. The guy last night was trying to bring in the subject of religion. and You know, he said, I don't believe in this. And he was trying to fist pump me. That I said, well, I don't know, but I'd like to. I said, when my dad passed, I look up at God and I think, I hope that there's something. I said, so we all change as we go on when something happens to us that you can... That, have, that's, yeah. a, that's the thing, I think, that it's unfortunately... With your kind, your life and your sexuality, you do get these people that then preach about God and the Bible. Which, if you're going to go by the Bible, you've got to stone your brother for putting two different yeah. crops next to each other <laughs> and stuff like that. Like what? You're going to stone your brother to death and yeah. stuff like that. And I think it's a it's a weak argument. Like in in today's society, where we're supposed to be more educated, yeah. like it does come that just acceptance, and that's where it comes to like mental health as well. Like it's the education and acceptance. Yeah. I think the more people just, even if you don't understand, I think more people don't understand it yeah. than anything yeah. else. You just got to go, cool. Well, t- tell me about it. Yeah. Like, explain it to me. Educate me. Yeah. But yeah. Pe- people don't like to be educated because mm-hmm. then they feel dumb. No, everyone's more opinionated, especially with yeah. society now. We're all looking on social media and stuff. Oh no, this is right. This is right. And they they draw all this information in, and they think Google is right or they're right or something. We just 
You know, yeah. believe what you want to believe, but don't put it onto other people mm. that you're trying to change them the way you're thinking. So, have you got a message? Like, obviously, normally at the end of the podcast, when we ask you, like, is there a message or something that you want? Words of wisdom. Words of wisdom. <laughs> Steve, Steve Lewis Barrett's Sorry, words of wisdom. Um, Would you leave someone with? I don't know. Just something. I don't know. Anything. Just be who you want to be and accept it. Don't worry about people judging you because I did it for years. You waste so much of your energy. You only get one chance in this life and don't live with regret of not living properly because it goes quick. Yeah, no, true. I'm sick that. Yeah, definitely. That is probably the best place to end that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah thanks for coming on. Yeah, really thanks, Dave. It. It's, it's been brilliant. Uh, it's been eventful. We'll yeah. put your socials and all that on the uh, bio, of yeah. the, uh, on the description and uh, whatnot. So it's all good. It's been brilliant. It's been good. Thank you Cheers. very much. Thanks Cheers.